So in this video, I'm going to look at electromagnetic induction or how we can generate electricity using the movement of conductors in magnetic fields. So this video is designed to follow on from the one I did on magnetic fields and the force experienced by charges. So if you don't know about that yet, you need to watch that one first because I'm going to use some of the concepts from that video. So what we've got here is we're going to have a wire and it says here is moving normally into the plane of the page. That means the conductor is going down into the page at right angles to the page. So if the conductor is moving that way, that means all the charges that are inside the conductor also have to be moving that way. So it says a side note here that this only works if we're dealing with conductors. And the reason for that is because we need charges to be free to move. If they're not free to move, we don't get any of the principles that we're going to talk about in this video. So that's why it has to be a conductor. Okay, so we've got the charges going into the page. So if we set up Fleming's left hand rule, so we've got positive charges going into the plane of the board. We've got field going across. So we can see that positive charges are going to travel downwards here, which means negative charges would travel up in the board. So that's what we've got there. Our positive charge moves this way, and our negative charge is this way. So, what it says here is if it's not in a complete circuit, that's all that's going to happen because these charges are going to get here and then they can't go anywhere. So, you're going to get a buildup of positive charge here, and you get a buildup of negative charge here. And we'll talk about the amount of charge we can build up in a second. So, what limits those things? So, that's if we move our conductor into the plane of the ball. Um, if we now connect it into a circuit, that means we don't get a build-up of charge anymore. So positive charge is still forced this way, or negative forced this way, but instead of stopping at the end, they're now free to go around and complete the circuit. So our conventional current would be going around this way, because that's the way positive charges would go. So that's if it's in a complete circuit, not just an isolated conductor there. So, that's if it's moving into the board. What if it's moving parallel to the field line? So essentially, the wire here is going, up, like say for instance, across this way here. So that would mean the charges were also going across. And you should know from the last video that if a charge is moving parallel to field lines, it won't experience force. And if the charges don't experience the force, they can't go their separate ways and build up at separate ends of the wire, so we can't get an EMF and we can't get a current. So that's if our wire is moving parallel to the field there. We're not going to get anything if charges are moving parallel. Okay, so then the last scenario, I don't know why I programmed those to go like that anyway, is what if the conductor is moving upwards? So what I mean by that, if the conductor is moving either that way or in this way. So in this case, it's upwards, so it's going that way. So we think that means our positive charges are also going that way. So we put that, we rotate around, and we can see that our charges will experience a force into the plane of the board, or negative charges would have a force out of the plane of the board. So actually, in your wire, this doesn't induce a current, because it's just making them move to the side, but it is still inducing an EMF because we're going to get a build-up of charge on the this side of your wire positive and this side of your wire being negative. So we're still going to get a build-up of charge, we're still going to get EMF, but it's not going to induce a current in the circuit because we need movement of charges this way or this way to give you a current in your circuit. And this is some of the physics behind something called the Hall effect, which you get in electric motors where the charges um, start to separate in it. So I'm not going to go into that, that too much, so you can look that up if you're interested in uh, the Hall effect there. Um, but that's if the wire is moving this way, so not into the board, up that way. Okay, so those are your three scenarios there. And then this links into something called Fleming's right-hand law, which I will now go on to, and we'll see that Fleming's right-hand law predicts all of the things that we've just seen with the left-hand law. Okay, so to give you some basics for Fleming's right-hand law, so this is a way of predicting the direction of a 
current that is in, induced, and more specifically, the direction of the conventional current. So your first finger is still the field, just like with the left-hand law. Your thumb now represents the direction of motion of the conductor you're moving, and then your middle finger will point the direction that conventional current will flow. And this will only apply when we've got a conductor in a complete circuit, because if it's not, we're not going to get a current, so we can't have a direction there. Um, so, let's put that back into some of the examples you've seen already. So, we already saw this one earlier with our wire going into the plane of the page. And we saw that this predicted that positive charges would go round this way. So, let's test that with our right hand law. So, the movement of the conductor is into the plane of the page. So my thumb's pointing into the plane of the page. The field is going across this way. So, thumb pointing inwards, field going across. You can see that it indeed predicts that conventional current will go round this way in your circuit, just as the left-hand law predicted. So, most people, when they learn these laws, see them as completely separate things. So, left-hand for force, right-hand for induction. But actually, they're essentially telling you exactly the same thing. It just depends uh, what which thing moving you're interested in. So right hand law is if the conductor is moving, left hand law thinks about it in terms of the direction of motion of the charged particles inside your conductor. So they both predict exactly the same thing and they both tell you conventional current comes around this way. Okay, so that's the right hand law. Okay, so now what we're going to look at is the factors that can affect the magnitude of the EMF we're going to induce in our conductor. So, um, the first thing we need to think about is what's limiting the EMF we get in our conductor. So, essentially we know with these build-up of charges caused by the magnetic force, and the magnetic force is trying to push them apart. But these are positive and these are negative. Those are going to attract each other, so there's an electric force pulling those charges back together. And the maximum EMF will be when the magnetic force is equal to that attractive electric force. And we can see that as we get more charges building up here, the electric force attracting them back is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as we build up charge, and we will eventually reach a charge where magnetic force is equal to the electric force, and then that determines the maximum EMF, in a nutshell. So, what we need to do is essentially increase the magnetic force, because then what we can do is increase the number of charges we can build up. So, if we increase the velocity of our charges, so essentially by increasing the velocity of our conductor moving through the field, we can see that that would increase the magnetic force. So, if we increase the magnetic force, that would allow us to push more positive charges this way and overcome the repulsion to positive charges from this one right here. So if we increase the velocity, bigger magnetic force, we can build up more charge. And actually, it's more specific than that, if we double the velocity of it, we get double the magnetic force, so we can then build up double the charge at the end, which results in double the EMF. So essentially, the EMF is directly proportional to the velocity of the conductor. Um, and that's under the preside proviso, the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So the velocity going into the plane of the board there. Okay, so another thing you could do to increase magnetic force is increase your magnetic field strength. So it should be fairly intuitive that doubling the magnetic field strength doubles the magnetic force, that doubles the number of charges you can build up, and so you get double the EMF. So EMF is also directly proportional to the magnetic field strength. And in terms of what that physically looks like, double the field strength means there's more flux lines per unit area, so the conductor is going to cut more flux lines if it's a stronger field, essentially. Okay, and then the last factor is the length of the wire in the field. So if you increase the length of the conductor, essentially you decrease the force between the charges in terms of the electric force. So again, just like before, so we find out EMF is directly proportional to the length of the conductor in the field. In terms of turning that into the, what it really looks like, if we have double the length of the conductor, we can cut twice as many flux lines using the same conductor. That's going to end up giving us double the EMF there. That's a useful way of thinking about it. 
So those are the three things that are going to affect the EMF we can induce on a conductor. So let's put those all together. And we get this equation here, where EMF is BL V sine theta. So the V sine theta is so we have the component of velocity that's perpendicular to the field. And then we have the field strength and the length of the conductor there. So what we can see is when we are moving perpendicular to the field, we end up with maximum EMF. And if we're moving parallel to the field, where theta is zero, we're going to end up with no EMF being induced, where theta is the angle between the wire here and the field. So if that's zero, it's parallel, no EMF there. So those are the things that affect the EMF for a conductor. Okay, so now let's introduce some terminology that's commonly associated with electromagnetic induction. So the first is something called swept area, or sometimes the area swept per second. So, essentially here, this LV sine theta is often known as the swept area per second. So to explain what that means is, the way I think about it, if we imagine this pen is your conductor, and it's moving through a field, so it's moving with velocity like that. Essentially, this has swept an area like this through. So as it moves through, this represents the area that's swept by that conductor per second. So that's what this LV sine theta calculates. It's the amount of area that the conductor sweeps through your field in a second. So we can see that that's multiplied by B. So we know that B is the number of fluxons per unit area. So if we multiply that by area per second, we get the number of fluxons that are cut by the conductor in each second there. So the reason we've got the sine theta is, is because we're interested in the area that's perpendicular to the field. So we know, if the, we know the area perpendicular to the field, we know the number of fluxons cut per second there. And this is often known as something called the rate of change of flux. So the number of flux lines cut per second is often known as the rate of change of flux. Okay, so that's if we have one conductor. What if we have n conductors? Well, we're going to cut n times the number of flux lines per second. And that's going to end up essentially with this. So we've got n times the area per second there, times the magnetic field strength, and that's often written in this form, where BAN is often called the flux linkage. So the total number of flux and multiplied by the number of turns of wire in your field. So then here comes probably the biggest law in terms of electromagnetic induction. It's called Faraday's law. So what Faraday discovered is that the induced EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. So what does that mean? Well, if we can double the rate of change of flux linkage, or double the number of flux lines cut per second, we will double the EMF that we can induce there. And this is the common way of mathematically expressing it, and you will often see a minus sign in here, which I'll explain in a minute. Another possible scenario we could look at in, in terms of induction. Now we've got Faraday's law, let's investigate a different scenario. So before, we had lengths of wire moving through a field. What about if we have a coil of wire moving through a magnetic field? In this case, we're going to look at a square coil of wire. So, if we think about this, the area swept per second perpendicular to the field, so the field here is going into the board, that's what these x's show. So the area swept perpendicular to that is going to be this length here, w, multiplied by the velocity in this direction. So that's what it says here. The swept area per second is W times V. So if we've got a magnetic field strength B, we can calculate the EMF by doing B the num times the number of cores, maybe we've got N rectangular cores stacked up, times W V. So that would be the EMF induced as that side here moves into the field. The interesting thing that happens with a rectangular coil is once the other side also gets into the field. Because once that is cutting through the field too, an EMF is going to be induced in that one. And because it's in a loop, that means we're going to get a current. So let's look at the direction of current for each of the sides. So the conductor here is moving that way. So 
we've got the field going into the board, the conductor moving that way, we're going to get a current going, going upwards, so anti-clockwise here. If we do the same thing on the other side, this one, we're going to still these two, so we're going to get current going up, going clockwise. So if they're the same length, then we're going to find the currents induced, or the EMFs induced, they're going to cancel each other out. So once the whole thing's in the field, we're actually no longer going to get an EMF anymore. Until we get right over to this other side, and this side leaves the magnetic field, and then only that one's in there, now we're allowed a current to go around this way, and we'll actually get an EMF in the opposite direction at that point. So that's just another application of Faraday's law there. Um, another one that comes out of looking for Faraday's law is, well, what if you have a stationary coil or a stationary conductor inside a constantly changing magnetic field, which maybe we can create with an electromagnet? Well, in that case, our area swept is going to be the area of our coils that's perpendicular to the field. So that's still the same, and that's a constant because it's just sitting there. And so if we have n coils of wire, if we multiply that by the rate of change of magnetic field strength, that should also give us the EMF. So if we can calculate this, we can work out our EMF. And if we know what the frequency of our AC supply is, for instance, we can work out this rate of change. So this links in really well to one of the assessed practicals for the AQA course, which is using a search coil to investigate the EMF induced when you have a like a coil of wire in a constantly changing magnetic field. So what we've got is an AC generator, and that's connected to this coil round here. So this coil is creating a constantly changing magnetic field. And we have another coil sitting here that is initially, put the area of that coil is perpendicular to that field. And so an EMF gets induced, which we can measure using an oscilloscope. So this investigation is going to look at, well, what happens if we change the angle of this search coil, so we like rotate it around, maybe up or down, and what happens to the EMF induced? So in terms of a simpler diagram, this is what it looks like to start with. So this is your search coil here, and it's represented here. So the area of the coil, you can see, is facing, and it's perpendicular to this field that's created here. So as that field changes, so it's going to be constantly flipping north to south there, that area is going to be perpendicular to a constant changing field, so we're going to get maximum EMF at that point. And we can work out which direction the field is at any given moment in time. If we rotate the search coil around, so it's now this way, so we've rotated 90 degrees, we find the area, which is essentially like this, is now parallel to the field. And if we have that, no flux lines are being cut, so we're going to get no EMF at that point. And what we'll see is you'll essentially decrease the EMF to zero as you go around there, and it makes a really nice uh, sine function graph. Okay, so that's the search coil experiment. Okay, so now we're going to look at something called Lenz's Law. So this carries on almost straight off from where we left off looking at Faraday's law. So this tells you about the direction in which you get induced EMFs and currents. So what Lenz's law says is that if you induce an EMF or you induce a current, that's going to act to oppose the change that created it. So say, um, for instance, you're moving a conductor down into a magnetic field, what that's going to do is induce a current in that wire that creates a field to oppose that downward motion. So it will induce a, a magnetic field to provide a force upwards. So in many ways you can kind of think of it like a bit, a bit like air resistance. So if you're moving downwards, you're going to get Faraday, sorry, Lenz's law says you're going to get a force upwards from the current that's induced, but it's going to be smaller than the, essentially the force you're using to move it downwards. So it's very much like air resistance. So we can modify Faraday's law at this point. So Faraday says the EMF is directly proportional to the rate of change of flux linkage. What Lenz's law tells you is instead of saying directly proportional, we can put equal to and stick a minus sign in there to show it's in the opposite direction to the rate of change of flux linkage there. Okay, so in terms of where this actually comes from, this is actually a small subset of conservation of energy because Essentially, if we think about it the other way, so if 
the EMF or the current you induced acted in the same direction, what that would mean is a falling object would be accelerated by the magnetic force, so then it would cut more flux lines per second, so it would induce a bigger current, and you get an exponential increase in the amount of energy, or in terms of this kinetic energy, because it would get faster and faster and faster. So that's if it was in the same direction, so what conservation of energy says is actually it has to be in the opposite direction, it's not allowed to be in the same direction, so that's kind of where that comes from. So let's look at a few applications of this so you can see what I'm talking about. Here we have a motor like we've seen before. So what we're going to do now is think about it in terms of induction as well as the forces too. So when a motor is spinning, you're going to have these conductors here and here cutting through a magnetic field. So that means we're going to get a rate of change of flux linkage, which means we're going to induce an EMF. And Lenz's law tells us that this EMF will act to oppose what's going on with the motor. So this is called a back EMF because it's going against what's creating it. So because a motor is a complete circuit, we're going to get a eddy current, essentially a current that's in the opposite direction to the current that's normally going around. So let's say the current that's making it spin is going around this way. So the eddy current will be induced in the opposite direction because it's trying to reduce the much rate of change of flux linkage. So because of that, the current going around the motor is actually going to be smaller than we would like. Because it's acting against it, it'll cancel it out a little bit. And so what that's going to mean is the, if the current's smaller, the force acting on the coil will be smaller, so the torque will be smaller, so it will spin at a slightly lower speed than you would want. So, like earlier when I was mentioning it was kind of like air resistance, it's the same here, so it causes it to essentially spin slower than you'd expect. So it's like a magnetic form of air resistance, if you like. So that's one example. We're also going to have a look at what happens when you drop a magnet through a coil, again in terms of Lenz's law. And what we're going to look at doing is explaining this graph that you get for the EMF as it falls through. So, here, in this position, the magnetic field for the magnet is not cutting through the coil at all. It's outside, its field is outside of the coil. So, if there's no field cutting through the coil, no EMF is induced, so that's why we start off here. We're not going to get anything. Okay? So, we drop this magnet, it's falling, but this field's not there yet. So, so what we'll now look at is it's had a chance to fall a little bit, so it's going a bit faster, and now its field is cutting through the coils. So, because the field is moving this way and cutting through the coils, we're going to get an EMF induced in our coil, which is why we can see it going up like this. I could have started by going down, but by convention we just start going upwards. And over time, the magnet is accelerating. So here it's starting to accelerate at a smaller number than g because of the opposing force, but it's still accelerating and still increasing its speed. So that's why the EMF gets bigger and bigger and bigger, because our rate of change of flux linkage is increasing there. So how does it actually create a force opposing it? So if the north pole of the magnet is falling downwards, that must mean a north pole is being induced in the top of this coil, because then it would oppose the incoming north pole. So we've got a north pole induced in the top here. So what's more interesting is, well, why does it go over the top like this? What's going on there? So to explain that, I'm actually going to leap forward a little bit to when it's exactly in the middle of that coil. So, when it's at this middle position here, if it's going to oppose this motion of this magnet, we can see the top of the coil must be a north pole to attract back the south pole. So there's still, in theory, a north pole here. But we can also see the bottom of the coil would need to be a north pole as well to repel the incoming north pole here. So we're trying to induce two north poles in opposite ends, and we're exactly halfway between the two. So what happens is the two currents that are induced cancel each other out, and we get no overall EMF being induced there. So that's what's going on in the middle. And leading up to that point, what's been happening is that these, this pole has been reducing, and this pole has been increasing over that time. So that's why we're starting to go over this one here. As we go past the middle of the coil, now this end of the magnet is more strongly a north pole than this one is. So this now becomes a north pole, 
this was the North Pole. So that's why we got this direction change to the EMF being negative, because essentially the EMF and the current induced overall in the coil is now in the opposite direction. And the magnet is still going accelerating, so it's still getting faster, so we can start inducing a bigger and bigger EMF. And we get to this point here, which is actually bigger than this one because it's traveling faster, so the rate of change of flux linkage is bigger. Then what happens is it starts to leave the coil, so fewer of the flux lines are cutting through the coil, so that's why we go up here, because you get a smaller and smaller rate of change of flux linkage, until it's completely outside the coil, where we once again get zero EMF, and it goes back to accelerating at G for that point. Okay, so that's what happens while a magnet is going through a coil in terms of Faraday and Lenz's law there, as long as the coil is in a complete circuit, otherwise this doesn't work. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave off this video. Uh, in future I will go on and look at transformers and AC circuitry and stuff like that. Uh, but for now, if you've got any questions about this particular video, please do feel free to comment and ask. I'd be more than happy to answer them. But as always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch.